So welcome tonight. Uh, my name is Corey Robin. I'm here to moderate a discussion about the, uh, the state of freedom today, not only in obviously uh, autocratic and authoritarian societies like Singapore and China, but also in more ostensibly democratic societies like our own, where citizens trade their liberty for security and prosperity, and where, to where what Tocqueville called soft despotism uh, seems often to quietly reign. To help us make sense of these developments, we have uh, two excellent panelists. Uh, on the far left here is John Kampner, uh, who wears many hats, but he's uh, the, the former editor of The New Statesman in Britain. And he's also the author of uh, Freedom for Sale, which is just out from Basic Books and is going to form the basis uh, for our discussion tonight. Freedom for Sale has been selected as one of the best books of the year by The Observer and The London Evening Standard in Britain. Uh, the London Times has called it original, persuasive, and disquieting, and the Observer described it as acidulous. So I want to thank John Kampner for coming here tonight and uh, for giving me the chance to use the word acidulous. Uh, so welcome, John Kampner. Uh, on my immediate left is Joel Simon, who is the executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, he's an expert and longtime advocate on issues related to freedom of the press. And he's written about that and related topics for such publications as the New York Review of Books, the New York Times, and Slate. So welcome tonight, Joel Simon. Uh, the way the discussion is going to work is that John's going to speak for about 20 to 30 uh, minutes. And then uh, Joel is going to engage him uh, with some follow-up discussion, uh, some questions. And then uh, we'll open it up to all of you for questions and for a larger discussion. Um, I just want to say that this. Uh, evening is this event is being broadcast on the web, uh, and uh, so you'll have a chance to see it again. Um, so, without any further ado, let me turn it over to John Kampner. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Corey, and thank you very much to the um, Open Society Institute for ho hosting this event tonight. Uh, one of the hats that I wear is Index on Censorship, which is Britain's leading uh, free expression organization, and uh, OSI um, helped to fund um, the activities of index. Um, and in addition, the OSI very kindly hosted me in a book event in Brussels as well, at their European office there as well. So I'm very grateful to them too. Um, the book was launched in uh, the UK um, and in other parts of the world in September last year. Um, and since then, I've been doing a lot of um, uh, speaking events um, around the world, which has taken me from Oslo to Singapore to India and elsewhere. Very happy uh, to be here to the launch of the um, American edition of the book. I'll set out very briefly um, what the book um, is about, and uh, then very happy uh, to hear people's questions. And what has intrigued me in different cities and different countries around the world is both uh, the common strands of the questions, but also how different the questioning uh, can be, um, dependent on, on the specificities um, of the place I happen to be in. At the end of 2007, the question hit me. It encapsulated many of the concerns I've been having about the state of global politics and economics, about the state of civil liberties, and perhaps most important of all, about the state of us, the people. And my central question throughout the book is as follows. Why is it that so many people around the world, irrespective of their culture, their circumstance, their geography, their history, appear increasingly willing to give up certain and several freedoms in return for the promise of either prosperity or security or both. The choices of destination might seem arbitrary to some, but there was method in the choice. The chapters in order, Singapore, China, Russia, the United Arab Emirates, broadly these could form uh, a contingent of semi-authoritarian states, and then India, Italy, the UK, and the US, those forming the, the band of, um, of real or notional or quasi-democracies. First of all, freedom for sale does not look at tyrannical regimes that rule by the barrel of a gun, where families and parents denounce each other, where the state is an unambiguously malevolent force, and where there is no element of consent. Therefore, this is not about Zimbabwe, North Korea, or Burma and other countries besides. In these countries, there is no pact between the government and the people, but an instinct simply to survive. Nor do I focus on countries with their own particularities, such as Israel, uh, with its conflict with the Palestinians, or Hugo Chavez's Venezuela, or post-apartheid South Africa. 
Instead, in the course of my travels, I focus on countries that whatever their political hue and whatever their circumstances have broadly accepted the terms of economic globalization. The model is Singapore, the state in which I was born and which I have long felt an affinity towards. I'm constantly struck, however, by the number of people, people with very high tertiary um, uh, degrees, um, with, who are very well traveled, who nevertheless are entirely happy to abide by and to argue for the pact, which is in return for one of the highest GDPs per capita in the world, there is a voluntary ceding of what I call public freedoms, which is what I will come to in a second. They will very eloquently defend a system that elevates individual restraint in return for the public good. The pact is played out in different circumstances and cultures and at different speeds, and yet we all do it. We each choose different freedoms that we are prepared to cede. In some, it's freedom of expression. In some, it's the right to vote out your government. In some countries, it's an impartial judiciary. In others, it's simply the ability to get on with your life without being spied upon. In many countries, it is a combination of these and more. And yet, in day-to-day -day terms, such restrictions as these affect only a small number of people. These people are, I might use the term, people who go out of their way to rock the boat, to cause trouble. Journalists who criticize the state or publish information that casts the powerful in a negative light. Lawyers who defend them and people like them, such as representatives of NGOs and opposition politicians. The rest of the, uh, of the population, well over 90%, carry on regardless. They enjoy what I call private freedoms, to live more or less as they wish and to make and spend their money. Now, what are private freedoms? They are the freedom to lead your atomized existence or the existence surrounded by the people that you care for unimpeded. These are, as I say, the freedom to make money, the freedom to start a business, the freedom to travel, the freedom to send your children to the school of your choice. Even in some countries, the freedom to wear the clothes that you wish or to have the partners that you wish to have in your private life. Now, in many countries where those freedoms did not exist before, they are undoubtedly to be cherished. But these freedoms have been elevated above what I call the public freedoms. These are the freedoms to act vigorously in the public realm. That is freedom of expression, freedom of association, and freedom to act actively, politically, um, most of all, the freedom to vote for an active uh, poli uh, body politic and a multi-party democracy. One can, ladies and gentlemen, accept the fact that one, therefore, is sufficiently free if you are looked after in your private realm. In the global order of the past two decades, the alliance of political leaders, business, and middle classes has been the key to this pact. This arrangement is built on a clear but usually discrete set of understandings. What matters in all these societies is that the number of people who benefit from the pact gradually increases and that the state remains flexible enough to meet their various needs. The preeminent freedom is the global financial right to earn money, to keep it, and to spend it. The context changed during 2008 as years of steady growth ended spectacularly. The collapse of the banks led not only to economic crisis, but called into question political structures too. And yet, for me, what has been so fascinating about the global economic crisis is the extent to which, at the start of it, there was some serious questioning about the economic order that began with globalization in 1989 and the death of uh, bipolar politics and the uh, rise of a single ideology, uh, Fukuyama's uh, end of history. There was a sense that I had last year and others too that this might have been a hermetically sealed era in history, 1989 to 2009, this part of the era of conspicuous consumption and material wealth as defining our societies was drawing to a closed to be replaced by something as yet indistinct. I have to say that I'm not convinced anymore. I'm not sure that this era has ended at all. So just very quickly, my chapters. As I say, I start with Singapore 
this remarkable um, social and, and e economic experiment. I then move on to China, where I was struck during my travels at the great candor of private conversations and this jockeying uh, incessantly over the question of free, of free speech, which even if formally circumscribed in China, particularly on the internet, is alive and well elsewhere. The government is trying to manage and channel it through a combination of technology, modern day spin techniques and force. What I found most intriguing was that the middle classes seem to have little vested interest in political plurality, in granting the vote to hundreds of millions of poorer people with different political priorities. This is not, therefore, a, a phenomenon driven purely by the Communist Party. The lack of constitutional democracy is, for the moment at least, part of the voluntary deal, in my opinion. The government knows, however, that the delivery of comforts to the private realm will determine its success. I move on to Russia, which I've been visiting regularly for 30 years. I focus on people I have known from a time when the expression of to get hold of something was more important than to buy, when, to, when foreign travel was allowed only through officially sanctioned groups. These friends of mine celebrated the failure of the coup in 91 and the subsequent collapse of their autocratic system. They discovered new freedoms and reveled in them. Yet democracy became associated with chaos and sleaze, and the ascent of Putin in 2000 was in keeping with his time, his security clampdown coinciding with a surge of wealth thanks to the global price of oil and gas. As their country became richer and more assertive, my friends would recite a slogan of the, only, of the three words that begin with C in the English alphabet that were important to new Russians, Chelsea, Courchevel, and Cartier. While doughty journalists and human rights campaigners continued to ask questions, the vast majority, however, acquiesced in the pact. These jet setters continued to fear, however, that their fortunes and their properties could at any point be seized. That is why they took their money abroad, and that is the weakness of the Russian pact. Yet they still enjoyed the fruits of their private freedoms and left the politicians and the security elite to rule unimpeded. The next chapter looks at the most curious symbol of the global pact, the United Arab Emirates, specifically the brazen and gaudy city of Dubai and the more discreet and oil-rich Abu Dhabi. A saying during those boom times on the floor of finance houses went, Shanghai, Mumbai, Dubai, or goodbye. From young British traders to Russian mobsters to C-list celebrities, the ruling sheikhs offered steady wealth from property deals to tax-free salaries in return for keeping out of trouble. Note that sentence comes again and again. In Dubai, they were even more accommodating, putting religious concerns to one side to allow Westerners to lead their lives as they wish. Monuments of, to conspicuous wealth sprung up all around. The sheikhs believed their model was immune to the Western economic crisis. The second part of the book is the more challenging part. It looks at countries that profess adherence to liberal democracy. I begin with India, which prides itself on having the world's most populous multi-party system. As China's ec economy soared, parts of India's corporate elite wondered whether this form of governance, whether their form, form of governance was actually an impediment to prosperity. India's rich devised its own pact. It would provide for itself the basic services that the state fails to deliver for just about everybody. In return, it will make very few demands of the state, and it, demand, and it requires the state to make very few demands of it. All it wishes from the government is to leave it to make money and to keep the poor away from its door. Of all the, challenge, of all the countries in the world, why choose Italy? It matters not because of any particular geostrategic relevance, but because it serves as an example of a sham democracy. In terms of its institutions, Italy fails on almost every count. The three checks on the executive, parliament, the media, and the judiciary, have seen their independence and, erode, um, and authority eroded. Corruption is rampant, and yet three times its voters have chosen in Silvio Berlusconi a man noted for his financial irregularities and his affection for autocrats like Putin. He has outwitted his opponents with consummate ease and is seeking to expand his powers now. It is easy to dismiss Berlusconi and his antics, but his enduring popularity among a large proportion of the population highlights the extent to which notional democracies can thrive and even depend on the same exercise of arbitrary power that authoritarian states are criticized for. In 1997, the accession of a center-left government in Britain that prided itself on changing the way politics was conducted should have been an inspiring moment. 
Yet in a decade, Britain has gone a long way to dismantling its civil liberties. It now possesses a fifth of the world's closed circuit television cameras. It has some of the world's most punitive libel laws. <coughs> a government that was seeking one of the longest terms of pre-trial custody for terrorist suspects proudly brandishes its authoritarian credentials, arguing that they are generally well received by the public. And yes, they are, at least particularly before they're closely analyzed. I look, therefore, at a government that abrogated its responsibility to produce a more equitable and a more liberal society. Instead, in a demonstration of what psychologists might call displacement theory, it exercised what power it had to clamp down on public freedoms. I'm keen to understand how British society seemed and seems still so ready to acquiesce in the erosion of those freedoms. My UK chapter has been described by commentators as the most critical of all of them. I do not necessarily disagree. My last destination is here, the United States, where the pact has been played out most visibly. The chapter traces the effects on society at home and abroad of 9-11, the Iraq war, and the abuses that surrounded the war on terror. George Bush's neoconservative mission had grown out of a mixture of hubris and frustration. The failure, however, of the Iraq war was the result not just of double standards, but of a deeper confusion about democracy promotion. Was democracy an end in itself, or was it a means to an end? Should multi-party elections be encouraged in states where the outcome might produce regimes hostile to the West and to the concept of liberal democracy? Domestically, Bush presided over a security clampdown that was rarely challenged by mainstream politicians or by public opinion. The US media, by and large, showed itself to be supine, failing to hold power to account on many of the gravest issues. As the writer Michael Kinsley wrote in late 2001, John Ashcroft can relax because people have been listening to their inner Ashcroft. So to what extent would the arrival of Barack Obama reverse the democratic erosion at home and America's loss of democratic credibility abroad? Well, you can argue the glass is either half full or half empty. Certainly, the nature of his election victory produced a much-needed boost to the credentials of America's constitutional democracy around the world. There are enough instances, sorry, the cruel irony is that, the new, is that a new administration in which many around the world had pinned their faith began its work, work just at a time of eroding American power. In conclusion, the events of the past decade have surely undermined the claim that the enrichment of a country or the growth of a middle class provide an impulse towards greater liberty. Barrington Moore's theories of no bourgeoisie, no democracy, have surely been refuted by the past 20 years of materialist aspiration. During this period, people in all countries found a way to disengage from the political process while living in comfort. Consumerism provided the ultimate anesthetic for the brain. My discoveries are discomforting, but it is more useful to understand than to judge. It has always been the instinct of the politician to seek power and to hold on to it by fair means or foul. Less understood are the reasons why so many of us, in authoritarian and democratic states alike, succumb, and why so few of us ask why we do it. Whatever systems we happen to live under, our priorities are more similar than we would ever want to admit. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, John. Obviously, uh, it's, a, it's a really uh, compelling, uh, provocative um, argument and, uh, and a, an extremely um, well-written and researched book. Um, the, uh, the, um, it's, a, it's, it's a combination of um, analysis and old-fashioned journalism, and uh, it, your, your anecdotes uh, and profiles uh, move the, the, the book along wonderfully. So I want to uh, commend you and, 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 and really uh, congratulate you on, a, on an extraordinary book. Um, I, I think my role here, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure, but I think my role is to try and uh, uh, ask some questions that you haven't been asked before, uh, which I know that it, when you're in the midst of a book tour, it's very hard to do. Um, uh, so I'll try and be um, a bit provocative. Um, Somebody but, asked me. Um, if I knew who would win the British general election. Okay, well, I won't, I won't ask you that, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, um, maybe I'll ask you a few other, few other things. Um, uh, but I know how hard it is to, to, to stump an author on tour because uh, 
you've probably heard just about every question. But, but let, let me, let me, let me uh, throw a few things out there. Um, I mean, the, 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 you know, when I read the introduction, I was you know, nodding and saying, you know, this is exactly how I feel. And, and, and the, 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 the premise of the book is, is absolutely, um, from my vantage point, you know, irrefutable. People around the world are doing this. They are giving up, uh, surrendering some aspects of their civil and political rights in exchange for some sort of stability or economic growth. You call it the pact. Um, I've actually, it's funny because um, uh, one country I used to cover, um, uh, uh, Mexico, they actually called it the pact. It was called El Pacto, and it basically was a, uh, an agreement between the oligarchy and the government about, um, uh, and it was a, a sort of anti-inflationary pact, but it essentially amounted to a public um, uh, uh, kind of uh, agreement about some of the issues you, you, you um, address in your book. So sometimes this is an unspoken agreement, and sometimes it's very much out in the open. But um, I mean, I think you also made the, a compelling argument that democracy and economic growth have been effectively delinked uh, in the minds of many people around the world. And I think that there is um, a compelling reason to do that. I mean, and you, and you cover it in your book. You cover China. You cover uh, uh, Dubai. And you cover Singapore. These are not democratic countries, we know that, and yet they've boomed economically while retaining um, a high uh, degree of political control uh, internally. So, okay, so, so democracy is decoupled from economic growth. We, we, we accept that. So what is, what, is the, what is the most compelling argument in its favor? Well, what about that it's um, still the best system for managing um, a political crisis peacefully? It's, it's, it's kind of a form of insurance. And if you don't have a political crisis, you may not need it. It's kind of like the US healthcare system in that you can just opt out and hope that you don't get sick. Um, um, the economies of China and Singapore have remained healthy. So um, the political system has not really been challenged. But how would the system that is in place in those countries respond <laughs> to, to a crippling economic crisis or, 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 or a major um, political crisis. And we may see this play out in Dubai because the economy is very sick. And the question is, can the political system, uh, is, is it without, without strong institutions, uh, without a, a mechanism for, for, the pub, for, for citizens to correct the, uh, the, the mistakes of the government, can, how, how will the system respond to the strain? Um, and in some regards, you could say this theory was tested in the United States, uh, where we underwent an, a huge political and economic crisis. Um, and you could argue that the um, uh, 2008 collect, uh, elections were a sort of mechanism for self-correction. And that's not necessarily an endorsement of the Obama presidency. But it, it, is, it has to be recognized that the, me the elections itself gave people a, me a mechanism to repute um, the Bush era policies, which you identify as destructive. So the question is, how per, you know, when, when people make this pact, is it a permanent pact? Or are there situations where they're able to reclaim the rights that, that, they, that they surrender? Um, and I will let you, you know, this is a lot to tackle, but let me just, so that, so let me just throw out a few more things. Um, and then I'll let you, uh, and I can summarize these back to you so you don't have to remember them all. But you know, like, like many readers, um, I'm a margin scribbler. Um, I, I read this on my Kindle, so this is, I'm just using this as more of a uh, <laughs> metaphor. But, but I, I did sort of make notes in the margin. And so now I get to feel a bit like Woody Allen in Annie Hall when he pulled Marshall McLuhan out from behind the wall. Because I get to actually <laughs> ask you the questions that I scribbled in the margin instead of just wondering for the rest of my life how the author would answer them. So let me throw out a couple. Um, you said that Venezuela represented a particularity, and I'm afraid, I, I'm afraid I don't agree with that. I mean, I think that, that there are certain trends that are certainly regional trends that Venezuela represents. Um, and you know, Daniel Ortega in, 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 Nic in Nicaragua or, or, or Correa in, in Ecuador are, are, are uh, emulating mm -hmm. some of the strategies that, that, that Venezuela has implemented, that uh, Chavez has implemented. So there is a kind of trend there. And I guess the question I have is, what is the pact in Venezuela, where people have you know, 
uh, uh, and in some of these other countries, because I, I think there is one, but I, I'd like to hear you articulate what, what, what people are getting in exchange for giving up some of their liberties from that, from that government. Um, then you talk a little bit about online culture in China, but you, don't, you deal with that less in the rest of the book. So mm -hmm. another question is, is civic and political culture disappearing from the physical space and moving into the virtual yeah. space? And is that something you looked at, or did you, is that something you, you did not consider? OK. You right. just, Should I, can I go on a couple more? If I remember them all. Uh, you won't have okay. to remember okay. them, because I'll go back. I'm just. Uh, but well, shall, I, shall I answer the internet? Go ahead. Why don't you answer the internet? And the, I go, mean, go, you, you, do get, you do get a gold prize. I have not been asked about Venezuela. OK. So, um, all right. Well, the other one, the internet, I guess, I, I guess I don't get a prize for that one. But um, that's all right. Um, um, <laughs> the reason for not choosing countries that had a particular conflict with a neighbor or with a regional power mm -hmm. was because that conflict, such as Cuba with the United States, yeah. Venezuela with the United States, defines so much of the politics. Um, so Chavez is Chavez in contradistinction to the opprobrium heaped on him by the United States and, and the Western world. And he uses that to define and then to clamp down on, on freedoms in his own country, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, it was for that reason yeah. and that reason alone, mm -hmm. rather than saying, no, there are elements of the pact that um, I, I decide not to focus on different countries, not because the pact doesn't exist in them, but because I regard the, the generalities of the pact as applying right. to other societies um, more. The question about the internet is an absolutely fascinating one. The reason I concentrate on the internet in China, but not, for example, in Russia, is simply because it's more powerful, which is a lot to do with demographics. In younger societies, the internet is more powerful. Russia is a declining and aging society, the only thing that matters, uh, the most important medium that matters in Russia is the nine o'clock uh, primetime news, Vremia, which is beamed across um, all time zones. And just like the Soviet times, it is the one thing that everybody huddles by their, by their TV sets right. to watch. And if you can control the TV in Russia, you can be more relaxed about, mm -hmm. um, about the internet. They, they do still, um, bloggers who are particularly controversial are, um, are, are given a hard time. I know several who have been threatened. And then, obviously, there are the human rights cam uh, campaigners um, and uh, uh, various journalists, again, several of whom I know who have either died or have been imprisoned or who um, have uh, 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 ended up um, uh, oppressed in, in other ways. So the, but the broader question about the internet is an absolutely fascinating one, because many people, again, there isn't a single answer to it, but it could be seen and has largely been seen as a great emancipating tool and also a galvanizing tool, particularly social networking, particularly Twitter with Iran last summer and the demonstrations which, which uh, enabled people to get on the streets. However, there is another explanation um, of the effect of, of the internet, and that is actually for semi-authoritarian states, and I need to develop my point about why this is a new form of authoritarian control that is quite that shares many characteristics with, but is also quite different from the old style Cold War type totalitarians. You could actually argue the internet works well for them because it, it operates as a safety valve mm -hmm. for people. So where, there you are sitting in your bedroom or your, or your study at home, uh, tapping away at your computer. And whether you're commenting on something or whether you're blogging about something, it's a wonderful, wonderful um, means to, to, to let off your anger with very little public galvanizing effect. Because if everybody is doing it in, 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 in blissful isolation, um, then it dissipates the, uh, the, 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 the galvanizing effect of, of public action. So you could actually argue that instead of people coming onto the streets or acting publicly and civically in a more collective sense, the internet is working in the other direction. Hmm. That's, that's interesting. Although. Uh, it's a complex example, but, but Iran certainly is a, yeah. is a, is a counterexample, and yeah. the dynamics are very different. Yeah. But also going back to Chavez, I mean, I, I think that, that Chavez was more um, a response to the um, uh, Venezuelan oligarchy um, to the United States in terms of his, his appeal domestically, um, and that the pact, if you will, there is a pact essentially with the poor people, the poor population which was excluded from politics and is now being mobilized to participate in the pact is, is, is a pact of social distribution, which is another, you, you, you will get some of the resources, uh, but uh, you will surrender some of your liberties. 
And um, that is a pact that uh, many um, leftist governments in Latin America have made with the populations, which are accepted by a sufficiently large number that the systems are politically viable, whether they're truly democratic sure. or not. So I, I think there is some sort of pact there. Um, now, just one, one thing I want to get to also is because we, we sort of share a role of running press freedom organizations is every, in every single case study you look at, you look at the role of the press. Um, and I wonder if you can now, because you, you, you tend to look at them within the context of each individual country, if you can sort of step back and make some generalizations about how the press fits into your, this overall theory and is placing some sort of limits on the press uh, a necessary precursor to the loss of other liberties? Or, or, can, these, or can these liberties be um, uh, um, taken away in the presence of a strong and, and independent and critical press? That's a very, very good question because <clears throat> it depends which liberties and it depends uh, which press. I mean, in the UK, for example, the debate about the uh, clawing back of uh, civil liberties has been had in the press. Right. And the more uh, the government uh, looks for an increase, for example, in pretrial custody, it was 24 hours when, when I was a kid, then it moved up to 14 days. And then Tony Blair tried to get it up to 90 days before you charge somebody, just throw them in prison and just think what you want to do with them for 90 days. Um, the, uh, the concession is now that it's only 28 days. Um, the higher the figure, the more among the tabloid press he was supported. So what you have uh, in, uh, you have often the law of unintended consequence when it comes to media freedom, um, is uh, you can have a politics of the lowest common denominator. But hey, that's, that's, that's a, price, a, a price worth paying. Where I think it's more interesting, I mean, for example, my, my critique of, of the United States is that there is a very vigorous press within narrow parameters. In other words, the scope of what is deemed to be um, mainstream politics is defined narrowly in this country, um, even using the S word, socialist, which in Europe is just another political party or the, you know, the, the alternate political party in this country has always been regarded as, as a sort of frighteningly extreme uh, concept. And, um, the, and then there's all areas of discussion, such as around the Middle East and, and areas where you have to tread very, very carefully in this country f for fear of being portrayed as either extreme or somehow on the margins of, of the debate. It doesn't mean you're in any way going to be oppressed in any way, but it is a way, there is a media conformism here, which is partly economic driven, but I also think partly societally driven as well, that, is, that leads to a free media in, in all its manifestations. You have the First Amendment here, which is something we're never going to have at home to our, to our great regret. So you have all the constitutional panoply in defense of a free press, but there is this element, I think, of, of political restraint that prevents all kinds of difficult and controversial uh, issues being discussed uh, in, in, in the broad mainstream media. It's always discussed in, in academic press or in, or, in, uh, or, in the, or in the radical press as well. So this, so this debate about what constitutes, uh, I, I prefer using the word vigorous media rather than uh, free, free press or free media. The, the debate about what constitutes a vigorous media is very specific um, to different countries. But without it, the <clears throat> it is a very instrumental and important part of what I call a vigorous body politic because the question about democracy is not just, I mean, the, uh, the organization Freedom House here has, has, has a very good um, chart, uh, as you know, of, 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 uh, of, of press freedom. The, which I think it peaked in terms of uh, democracies that had uh, free presses in 2000, 2001. For me, the issue is not ticking boxes about democracies. It is a manifestation of the quality of a democracy and the vigor of that democracy, too. OK, let me, let me try one last question about the US. And I would, I would venture this is one you, 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 haven't, you haven't been asked, but picking up on the, the US analysis. Uh, OK, try and flip this on its head and see the issues you described from the perspective of the, the, the uh, 
the right here in the United States, which is experiencing a powerful grassroots mobilization mm -hmm. right now. From their perspective, um, they are actively defending their freedom from government intrusion. They are allied with powerful forces within the media that support their agenda. Um, now, the people in this room, including myself, may, may, may not identify with these concerns. For example, I don't see anyone here carrying an unconcealed weapon. But um, shouldn't we recognize that they are mobilizing to defend their freedoms, whether it's the you know, right to bear arms, the Second Amendment as they see it, or the right to be free of government intrusion and health care decisions, and, and sure. that, and that um, in a sense, they are refusing to submit to the, the pact as you, as you describe it? Absolutely. I mean, this book is not a political. I, I, would, yeah. I would venture to, to suggest this book is in no way a politically partisan book. This book is about the erosion of freedoms variously uh, manifested and variously um, described. And, and uh, you know, we both work for, as you say, for free expression organizations. I spend a lot of my time defending um, the rights of uh, groups in the UK on the right or on the far right to, to have their word that um, uh, would otherwise be denied to them or, or, or they would be decried um, um, for, for so doing. So it is about creating a, um, th the great enemy to all form of healthy democracies is what I call an, an anesthetized society. When societies become docile, um, when they define themselves th through branding, and through uh, self-fulfillment or the aspiration of wealth, even if you do not have it yourself, then you open the door for an empty political space. And therefore, you can't blame people for jumping into that political space who are motivated if that space is empty. And this book doesn't blame uh, uh, groups. It doesn't blame politicians. It doesn't blame financiers. It is saying they are operating in, a, in an environment um, of a depoliticized society in which the private freedoms are held very dearly and is incumbent on societies to, to produce and protect these uh, private freedoms. And in return, the public realm is left empty. Well, I'm afraid you answered all those, so I'm going to have to ask you who's going to win the elections. <laughs> and okay. Maybe you can answer that. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to all of you in a second, but I actually, this conversation did make me think of, a, of another question, which is that it seems like a, a lot of what drives your analysis and, and the problem as you see it is this drive on the part of the middle classes and the as people who are aspiring to be in the middle classes for material comfort and wealth and sort of participating in the consumer republic that we all share. And it, what it made me think of, though, is, is that in the United States, at least, and I think this is probably true of Europe, but I'll stick to the United States, the single most important thing that has driven the expansion of freedoms have been uh, social movements, the worker, especially the labor movement. That was what made freedom of the press and freedom of the speech realities in this country. But those movements were all generated by the idea of wanting to share in the material wealth of the republic. So it was it, uh, wealth, per se, and the desire for material comforts don't necessarily have to produce the kind of privatized uh, dystopia that you're that you describe. Oftentimes, it produces the opposite. And I was just wondering what you think it is about the moment we're in. Assuming you're correct that that is what's producing sure. the problem, what is it about the structures and the moment that we're in that it's producing the problem in the way you see it, as opposed to a hundred years ago when it produced the exact opposite? I think the difference is is the numbers. It's the proportions in society. If you have a middle class, which is defined very loosely deliberately by me, and, and it is very different. What is the Indian middle class? It's, it's, it's hugely different to, to the Chinese one, to the American one. But if you have a, um, a middle class that is constantly um, uh, increasing in size and increasing in power and leverage, that is in pretty much every country, whether it is a representative uh, democracy or where it, where it conforms to this pact with, with, with authoritarian or semi-authoritarian um, governments, it is keeping this large constituency of the population satisfied is now the key to, um, is the mm -hmm. key to success. And if you can, and it is endlessly fascinating. If you look at what happened in, in China over the last couple of years, everybody, all journalists were writing um, uh, with the uh, decline of the American um, uh, export market um, for Chinese-made um, goods, 
and I was, I was in southern China and factories were closing and it was just absolute um, conventional wisdom in the West and in China that there, were going to be, there was going to be a social explosion. And yeah, there, there, there was the odd demonstration and this and that, but it was reasonably easily handled. And the government's absolute drive, there was this mythical, we must achieve 8% economic growth. It was an arbitrary figure, but it became the holy grail. We must make 8%. Now, whether they did it uh, actually or whether the figures were manipulated in order to allow them to show that they did it, they did it. And it was the fact that they were showing to the Chinese people, just hang on in there, your material concerns are being met. Your aspirations mm. are going to materialize. And this was quite clearly an absolute um, fear that the Chinese government had. My goodness, if we don't make this 8%, everything is going to go up mm. in smoke. Mm. So let's do that. So this is, this is really the thing. It is, it is um, and this is going to be the test in, in, years, in years to come as well. But if you can continue to satisfy, and those needs will change. This is a very flexible pact. Um, uh, but, but what is so uh, interesting, going back to the Barrington Moore point, was uh, back in, in uh, from 89 onwards, there was just this absolute sense that you, you talked about in your, in your introduction about um, uh, economic and uh, political um, uh, freedoms going together. You free up one, the other will be a natural concomitant of, of, of the other. Uh, this was the great, not just Thatcher, and Re uh, Thatcher Reagan, but it, it went across all political parties, that free markets and free societies would build on each other. That has surely been disproven now, mm -hmm. because if you can um, move people away, I mean, in countries where before there were no freedoms, that was entirely different. But if you can provide them with this medically <coughs> sealed private freedom, mm -hmm. then that is enough mm -hmm. as long as their ability to earn and to share the wealth in the country can be constantly, constantly fed. Mm. OK. Uh, yes, in the back there. I think there's a microphone that's going to be coming around. Is that uh, one quick note. Also, uh, we are, as you can see, recording tonight's event. So if you choose to ask a question, you're also giving your consent to be included in that recording, which will be used on the web and beyond. Um, just a moment. But don't let that deter you. And held against you. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, um, thanks a lot. Um, given the uh, current decimation of the American middle class, do you see them waking up um, to cope with what uh, Sheldon Wolin, as I mentioned to you, sees as a soft or inverted totalitarianism in America? And as a uh, follow-up, um, perhaps might it take uh, given the Tweedledum, Tweedledee nature of our uh, so-called two-party system, might it take a uh, bona fide third party to spring forth uh, somehow from Zeus's head to wake them up? I mean, so will economics do it? Might a third party and how that comes about, who knows? Or uh, are we destined for more, uh, you know, more of a, uh, a restful slumber as, as our rights not so gradually erode? Thank you. Well, if it's any reassurance, you're not alone. <laughs> um, everyone is in that slumber. Even the French, who um, need no, um, usually need no excuse to take to the streets and demonstrate, are not doing it over this financial crisis, which is a source of endless fascination to me and, and to others besides, um, you know, without getting too deeply involved in, in, in the in the, uh, in the history of, of this financial uh, crash, and, and many uh, experts uh, better qualified than me have, have done this. But in, in the shorthand, the um, micro group, the microeconomic group that caused the financial crisis um, are the ones who have got away with it scot-free and who are the ones who are now benefiting um, from, from the new environment. And the vast majority of people who had no culpability in the economic crisis are the ones who are suffering. Now, by any standard of reading of history of the last two, two, three hundred years, you would think that spells an awful lot of trouble. But it hasn't happened. It has somehow dissipated. I'm afraid I have not got the answer um, for why over the last year, 18 months, across the world, there has been so, so little um, uh, there's been some. There's been anger, and there's been anger variously expressed. Um, some people here 
talk about the Tea Party movement as being part of that, um, of that anger. Uh, that could well be the case. I'll, I'll give one little explanation that actually um, may or may not have a bearing on it. But in the UK, um, when the, both the two main political parties announced that they were going to um, increase the threshold um, at which you have to pay death duties, um, and a tiny proportion of people pay death duties in, in the UK because of the level of the threshold. They were going to, I think, maybe 10% of the population pay, pay death duties, and they were going to raise it so that maybe only 5% of the population um, pay it. It was an extraordinarily popular measure. <laughs> and so what does that say? It is about the aspiration that even though I'm never going to be well enough, uh, I'm never going to be rich enough myself uh, to bequeath to my children that kind of money that would ever be... Uh, be due for, for death duties, one day I or they might, might be like that. So therefore, it is a, it is a good thing to, uh, to protect aspiration. I mean, it's a, it's a very glum uh, conclusion to draw if, if, you're, if you believe in some sort of more collective or, 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 or communal spirit um, about, about taxation. There's only a certain amount of money in the pot as well. But I can only assume the docility um, when it comes, because the docility existed all the way through. The book is about, you know, during, during the times of plenty in particular, um, you can understand docility when you're too busy buying your new TV set to worry about the state of, of democracy or, or, or whatever else. But when, you know, the cash register stops, stops ringing, you would think that that is a time for greater questioning and, a, and, and greater... A political and economic um, ferment, but it hasn't happened. Yes, in the back over there. Yes, thank you very much for your very interesting analysis. I'd like to know uh, where you think the uh, incredible uh, ostentation that exists in Dubai and the present economic uh, instability will possibly lead to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dubai is, um, is, is a curious case because, I mean, it really is the, it's, it's like a theme park for um, everything that has happened over the last um, 20 years. I mean, it is extraordinary. Everybody is doing deals with everyone. I mean, the pact is, uh, I, 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 could, I could go on forever about the pact in, in Dubai. The Americans turn a blind eye to the fact that Dubai is the main port where trade sanctions against Iran are busted. At the same time, the Dubai government turns a blind eye to the Americans planting uh, agents all over the place to, to, um, to monitor al-Qaeda. At the same time, the Americans turn a blind eye to various al-Qaeda people laundering money there, and, and then people turning a blind eye to Western demonstrations of ostentation. It just goes on and on and on. And the reason everybody is turning a blind eye, or was turning a blind eye, is because everybody was making money and everybody financial interests um, were being served, down to relatively um, lower middle class Brits, Europeans, Americans, Indians, huge amounts of Indians uh, with second homes um, in, in Dubai. Now, um, the country is being, uh, or, or that emirate, is being bailed out by its um, sister emirate, um, uh, Abu Dhabi, where all the oil um, resides, and which has also been far more discreet in its in, it, in, it, in its bombast, in its, um, in its kind of gaudiness, and um, has been much less over-leveraged um, than Dubai has been. And literally, um, one of the sheikhs is, is bailing out the other in perpetuity. So um, uh, Dubai will uh, continue in its great gaudy technicolor from time to time. Various people, a lot of people have lost money there, those who um, uh, lost on, on real estate and had to distress sell. But for those who didn't, they're just biding their time and it will, um, it will continue in its, uh, in, its, in its blissful way. You had your hand up earlier. Yeah, hi. Um, oh, I think they want you to wait for the microphone, sorry. Um, I guess over the last 30 years, it seemed that the, uh, the disparity between wealth, I mean, has grown wider in this country and in Europe, uh, virtually all over the world. 
Um, how does that play in with your thesis? Mm. Well, it, it depends whether you define poverty as absolute or relative. Um, uh, you know, economists uh, consistently argue with the, the country, uh, I, th uh, I, th I think if my figures are up to date, the, the large country, the uh, major country with the largest uh, Gini coefficient gap between rich and poor is China um, now, um, which, which is endlessly fascinating. The Chinese super rich um, are, play their part in the pact in, in, in their way by being really quite discreet. They're not in any way like the Russian oligarchs, throwing money around and buying soccer clubs and um, having super yachts moored off Cannes and, and, and all that kind of thing, because their part of the deal is, from the, from the, from the Communist Party, will, will allow you to con continue to do this as long as you don't make a big uh, song and dance of it. Um, as long as you can keep um, Back to my point about the growing middle class, you can keep growing that middle class and keep giving people the aspiration that one day they can join it, while at the same time, as long as you can keep um, the poor in a lesser degree of destitution and poverty than they have otherwise uh, been. In other words, you, you um, deal with the issue of absolute poverty and absolute living standards rather than relative poverty and relative um, living standards, then the evidence suggests um, that you can continue uh, to get away with it. I mean, the, it's an interesting uh, uh, country attitude surveys across Europe suggest that there is a decreasing uh, appetite for fiscal redistribution than there was five or 10 years ago at a time when the uh, income gap has got bigger and bigger. Um, or not so much the income gap, but the asset gap, because when so much of it is related to uh, either liquid assets or, or property. So uh, the, the inclination is, is to say that, as, as I say, as long as you can grow the middle class and keep um, the poor from being as poor as they previously had been, then you can get away with a, with a rising economic inequality. But here in the United States, though, well, I go back to my original answer about if the situation was as acute as it should be, given the, um, given the numbers, there should be trouble. And there isn't. And one thing I do not um, uh, allow myself to entertain are issues of conspiracy theories around um, the media, people not getting the right information. You know, there is information out there for people to find out you know, whether it was the culpability of the banks or whether it's rising income inequality. People have the material if they wish to exercise it. They're choosing not to exercise it for the moment. I mean, I don't know if it's your supposition that uh, there is going to be a great m moment of political change here. I, I see little, I, 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 the evidence that I have is that everybody is just working hard to get out of this recession um, to get back into positive growth, in which case this recession globally, rather than being seen as one of these great era-changing moments, will actually just be another cyclical downturn. Uh, yes, over here. I'm just wondering, throughout, let's say, the last century, there have been these different eras where political thinkers like yourself come and say, this is the new order. Um, with the rise of fascism back in the 1930s, there were those who said, this will overtake capitalism and freedom in the West. People like Joseph Kennedy were in somewhat despair. Then after the war, it was our system versus the Soviet system and yeah. the Chinese system yeah. at the time. And then after that ended, it was, ah, capitalism has won, and yeah. this is the new era. Now we seem to be <clears throat> into this soft totalitarianism. Do you think that this potentially is an aberration, or this is just the next 20-year phase until we hit the next political, whatever po politics du jour is at that time? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 
I seek not to to, to soothsay and to um, to, to uh, say what what will be the case. My my analysis is confined to uh, analysis of the past twenty years, um, and obviously with with conjecture about where it leads us in the future. I mean, the uh, geostrategic rise of China and people debate about the speed, whether you know when it becomes the world's largest economy, but also. They debate the extent to which it has already happened, and that's a, a, a live debate and, and, a, and a legitimate debate to have. But nobody doubts that the balance is shifting. The question is how far, how fast, and, and, and where it will end. And it manifests itself in, in diplomacy in terms of the Chinese vetoing pretty much anything that involves um, what you might call the promotion of liberal democracy in, in other countries or interventionism, um, whatever the rights and the wrongs of Iraq and Afghanistan, I would venture to suggest that there will be no more large-scale US-led military interventions for the either real or perceived or notional or whatever um, promotion of democracy um, in other countries because simply the economic um, shifts have changed and uh, the, the power that is wielded by countries um, that are semi-authoritarian or authoritarian um, is too great for that to take place um, with as much ease um, as it did before because the Clinton and Bush eras uh, very much marked that era of unipolar power um, and American hegemony, which uh, whatever the debate about s speed and, 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 and scale, is definitely shifting. And I mean, the, the enshrining of the G20 is, is an absolute case in point. People now talk about the G2, just America and China. And basically, if, if Obama can't square it with the Chinese, um, then it's not going to happen. Um, so uh, that, that's very much, uh, and, but that has, that has great impact on, um, on the, the state of democracies um, uh, in the West. But it's also endlessly fascinating about I mean, there isn't a single Chinese model that is, that is fixed in stone now. My analysis of, of China is very much that it's a game of cat and mouse and that the Chinese are trying to... If you, if you think of um, if you're um, switching off the, the tap on your radiator um, uh, at home and you switch it off completely and then you think, well, just how much am I going to switch it back on again now? That is exactly what, what, where the Chinese are. They're, they're constantly... Um, working out how uh, how uh, much to open open the tap just before the Olympics, they switch it off almost completely for fear of of the consequences of political demonstrations. During that, people anticipated, oh well, they would be more liberal um, after the Olympics. They weren't, but they, it's 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 constantly in flux, and that is very much a reflection of the dilemma that authoritarian, non-totalitarian uh, governments have. Um, which is how much freedom am I going to allow, am I, am I going to have to give um, uh, this most important population group, um, the middle class, how much freedom am I going to be able to get away with? Um, and that's the constant debate throughout. Earlier, that um, you commented on how counterintuitive it is that there's this lack of a public outrage about the economic meltdown, and it made me think about how the um, it seemed to me the coverage of um, the demonstrations in Greece made it seem as if those crazy Greeks they will not accept the austerity they must accept. It's like their fault that they're not being a little more docile, really. <laughs> and is it where, what do you think is driving this? push toward, like, push to keep the public docile or, you know, the uh, government's more authoritarian in nature? Is that from the government's trying to maintain power more? Is it from fear by the public? Is it their, their sense of relative comfort or aspiration? Like, what do you think is mm. the biggest driver here? Well, you, 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 you've asked the, the, the most pertinent of all the questions. What is the driver of this, of this docility? Is it, are we doing it, or are they just simply reflecting um, our desire um, for it. I mean, as I say, I, I keep on using this, this private public freedom issue. It is not that people do not want a say. It's not that they, they, you know, 
it is not that people do not want to determine their own lives. They do want to determine their own lives, but they want to determine their cocooned lives. Um, and they don't want anybody, they don't want the state interfering in that. They don't want the state telling you where you should send your kids to school. Um, and you know, here in this country particularly, there's much more of an onus on, on, on the government as a sort of malign economic force, certainly among uh, large uh, sections of uh, the population, I think, differently interpreted in, in Europe and, and elsewhere. Um, less and less, as I was researching the book, did I think that the culpability lay with governments. Um, and more and more do I think it lies with us. Um, particularly in, it is much more understandable if you are, say, a Russian who has been used to, or their, your parents have been used to periods of, uh, of out and out repression, and then slightly relaxed repression, but still repression, and then even greater repression. Um, and then you're told, oh no, you can do this, you can do that, you can. Um, it's understandable that you are cautious, and it's understandable that if you're given certain private freedoms that previously you have never enjoyed, if you have never been allowed independently just to leave the country, without anybody asking you where you're going or not letting you go, um, you know, it is an extraordinary increase in your freedom. So if, you're, if the choice is between no freedoms and private freedoms, then you're going to go, you're going to go for private freedoms. And, and I would do exactly the same. If, however, you come from a notional democracy, such as this country or mine, and you have your private freedoms, and you've always had them, and yet you've cho you are choosing to prize those and not to exercise the public freedoms that you have anyway, um, then you know, what, is, you know, what is going on here? You know, if you demonstrate, sure, there is going to be here and there uh, police and others photographing you, and you're worried about this, you're worrying about that, but you're not going to go to prison. Um, if, you know, the, the sense of, yeah. By the press. OK. Um, but that is a different form. That is an exercise of futility, right? A futility is different to oppression. Um, and so the, it is much less understandable, the docility in, um, in Western countries, in established Western countries. I think the, uh, and it, the easier way of understanding it during the, the, the time of comparative plenty was that simple, people were simply satiated. They were simply too busy just having a good time and, and um, uh, aspiring to or enjoying their material needs. This docility now, going back to my um, uh, question to the previous questioner, is the part that's less, un that's less understandable here in the West. But what about just, if I can, if I can jump in. Sure. Um, how does Iran then fit into this? I mean, two, two things. One is, could it be that people um, are not actively demonstrating in the streets because there is no um, via, viable form of political ideology that unites no, them? I mean, it, is there no alternative no, model? Iran is, is a classic case of a, I mean, but that's a that's, it, well. It, I mean, it's pretty totalitarian. No, no, no. But what I'm talking about is the people who are out in the street in Iran yeah. who are risking their yeah. lives. But that it, is the it, first phase it, of if you have a totalitarian <laughs> regime, whether mm -hmm. it, and look at the orange demonstrations in, in yeah. Ukraine yeah. or the Velvet Revolution in Georgia or any, the many areas around the world where you have a totalitarian regime, right? Where there is a man with dark glasses on the street corner. Or the guys with the, on the motorbikes, um, you know, smashing you with clubs or shooting you um, in Iran if you if you demonstrate. That is a galvanizing force, right? That is a classic 20th century phenomenon of people rising up to rid themselves of totalitarianism. It's what happens afterwards that's that's more interesting. The Russians, um, through various phases, did get rid of their system. And what is fascinating about that was they then had this, um, this spring of pretty much unbridled press freedom and political freedom um, accompanied by economic uh, chaos, although some of that was exaggerated. Um, and there was a sense of this is too much 
this is too much to handle. So, so the ridding yourself of totalitarianism is the easy part. It's what you can, I don't mean easy part, it's the simple part, <laughs> right? right? It's, the, it's the linear, understandable part. It's what you do with, with um, having joined the, you know, the family of non-totalitarian nations. It's what happens after that that, in my opinion, is the more intriguing prospect. But your story about how we were all enjoying our prosperity of, of, up until 2008, I mean, there's one wrinkle in it, which you briefly mention in the book, which is that beginning in the late 90s, there did start to be a global movement around the sort of questions about uh, the, the relationship between markets and democracy, capitalism and democracy. Um, it was culminated in this, you know, in this country, in Seattle, yeah. in 1999, and in Genoa, uh, uh, which I can't remember if Genoa was after 9-11 or just before. It was, just bef it was, it was a summer, just a couple was, of months just before it. Okay, so it was just because before. Because there was going to be a huge anti-IMF and in World DC, Bank in right. D.C. straight after 9-11. And it, you know, it's always hard to practice counterfactual history, but it did seem like that was beginning to be put on, that was going to be the agenda yeah. for discussion. And what 9-11 did, among other things, was to really just take it off the table. Yeah. I mean, it just said this is you know, a non-starter, and they actually canceled that demonstration because it was thought to be too dangerous. So again, I mean, it, it, there seems to be something a little bit, um, not to use too academic a word, essentialist about this story, that somehow or another in these times of plenty, you know, uh, we've, we've accepted this trade-off, and it's something in ourselves. Is that, is that really the case, or is it just a little bit more contingent? Is there a little bit more historical factors and events? Well, then you get into counterfactual about what would have happened if 9-11 hadn't happened, what yeah. would have happened to, to the anti-globalization movement. I mean, uh, whatever the violence of Genoa and, and Seattle, it was, uh, you know, these were, these were powerful movements, but these were still, in political terms, small movements. Mm -hmm. And they were barely making a pinprick on, on, um, on the governments that they were, that they were affecting. So, um, so yeah. I mean, 9/11 did produce this this enormous sense of if you um, of, of an understandable sense of fear and, and a need to rally round. But mm. that was then taken to uh, to another level by saying, and if you question any aspect of the viability of the system that we feel is so imperiled, then by nature, you're either a terrorist or you're, or, or right. you're a dangerous customer. So it, right. made it, it made it all the more harder, in this country in particular. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman right here, um, where's the, oh, there's the mic. No, no, this, this gentleman here has had his hand up for a while. And then. Um, oh, one point that really resonated with me was uh, your point that, um, sorry, um, that you could, uh, distinguish between the public and and private freedoms, but I see um, there can be a problematic um, part here if you are to talk about these freedoms as being a priori um, existing to be traded or to to have eroded. And I don't want to sink into absolute cultural uh, relativism, but uh, I think that this argument has sometimes been used for some of the the worst policies of exporting democracy. Um, so I wanted to hear what you. I had to say about that. Um, and also uh, with, I guess this is a kind of a second question, uh, with the consolidation of kind of a two-party system in the West um, and very restricted um, realm of politics, do you think that liberal democracy as it stands is in crisis itself? Um, on, on the second point, I'm not sure liberal democracy is in crisis, I, uh, but as much as it does it really exist? I mean, it's sort of stagnant. It's a bit of a shell. It is there, and people, every four or five years, depending on your country, go through the motions of voting. And some people, are, a small proportion, are, are, are politically um, active. But the political membership, you know, membership of political parties has collapsed pretty much um, everywhere. Turnout in most countries um, collapses, uh, has, has collapsed pretty much. But again, if you define your democracy simply on, on individuals doing their duty every four or five years, it's, um, it's not a particularly um, healthy uh, democracy. Um, but so therefore, there's no reason why liberal democracy in the countries that, where it is established uh, needs wither and way because it's not really being practiced. Um, so therefore, it can continue, in my opinion, um, in its 
existing form. I wasn't, qu I wasn't quite sure I got your, your first question, but I mean, on the question of democracy um, promotion, the two weaknesses in uh, the school of, of democracy promotion, um, just putting Iraq uh, to one side uh, for one second, were that you, your legitimacy in promoting democracy is surely weakened if the quality of your own democracy is hardly a shining example, um, is the first one. And secondly, what bit of democracy are you seeking to promote? Are you seeking to promote the notion of multi-party democracy? In other words, let the people have their say, in which case you will end up with all series, a whole, a whole lot of unintended consequences, such as famously the election of Hamas in, in, in Gaza and, and elsewhere. If Jordan uh, wasn't a monarchy, and had a, a, um, a one attempt at a multi-party system, it would not have the kind of, uh, it would be a, a much more radicalized um, society than it is. And so this affects Washington and other policymakers um, all the way through. Are you looking for a kind of liberal, um, a, a more liberal kind of society, in which case, one person, one vote may not actually produce it, or are you simply, China is another example, many Chinese intellectuals simply say, I know this pains me to say it, but actually um, full, um, you know, uh, full voting rights for everybody would not produce the kind of um, China that you in the West think it would produce. In fact, in many ways it would be the reverse. It's, it's a proposition that, that's hard to test. So democracy promotion, and then add the third point, which is the waning power of America to act unilaterally anymore. Um, I'm not sure we're going to be seeing very much um, vigorous and certainly uh, military driven democracy promotion um, for the foreseeable future. Uh, I'm going to just take one more question. And oh, so wait, just if you could. Yeah. Oh, we both sort of raised our mm -hmm. hands at the same time and he preempted part of what I wanted to ask. Uh, the operative word in my question is degree. Uh, I don't know if you've gone to Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, socialist countries, but is the degree of tension between public and private the same? How does it vary in socialist countries? Well, I'm, I'm not sure I would describe those as socialist countries. I mean, okay. social democratic, maybe. I mean, Sweden is currently run by a conservative government. Um, um, but the role of the state there is much more enshrined. Taxation is regarded as a, as, as a public good, uh, not something to be um, avoided. Um, although a lot, of, a lot of that settlement is fraying um, in, in, in those um, countries. But I was asked, it was interesting, I was asked in Oslo um, about, about this whole phenomenon. And um, uh, one, body, one person said, uh, why are you not including the Nordic countries, the Scandinavian countries, as one of these examples? I mean, Sweden is the, the northern, Sweden is Singapore with snow, somebody said, um, which, which I thought was, uh, was quite an interesting idea, this idea of people um, abiding by the status quo and not, and not seeking to rock the boat. I mean, I think you can, uh, there, is a conf there is a cultural uh, collective conformism. However, the quality of those democracies uh, in terms of um, a vigorous press, um, uh, freedom of association through trade unions, um, and pretty healthy political system, uh, I would still put very much um, on the credit side rather than, rather than the debit side. There is that slightly sort of stifling sort of uh, um, cultural thing which I could be incredibly sort of trivial about, and that's nobody ever crossing the road when, when there's a red man you know, at, at, at the light, that sort of sense of, of, of social um, conformism. But um, as I, I, I rejected it as, a, as an object of, of the pact, because I think um, those are examples, rare examples, where I think certainly the institutional, constitutional side of uh, democracy um, are operating um, as healthily as anywhere else in the world, I would say. Well, I want to uh, thank our, all of our, our, our panelists and all of you for coming. I want to thank uh, Joel Simon and uh, John Camphor. The book is called Freedom for Sale, Why the, Wor Why the World is Trading Democracy for Security um, from Basic Books. 
Uh, you can get it on Amazon.com and uh, in the lobby <laughs> right out there. And I also want to thank the, uh, the Open Society Institute for hosting uh, this, uh, this discussion. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.